we watched Sea of Monsters for this, the, the movie, the Logan Lerman movie, which was totally off the rails. Um, and it's really funny because I was like, okay, let me get some background stuff on the movie before we start. Because I don't, I don't know if you ever watched the Girls Next Level podcast, but it's like the girls from Girls Next Door. They'll, they're doing rewatches of their old show, right? And so they like to start with what they call the grotto time machine, which like is, you know, the grotto from uh, Hugh Hefner's man mansion, but like hot tub time machine. Um, and so they'll talk about like the time a little bit. So what's interesting to note, because we had people join for my ex-boyfriend story with the first movie that like the story again for anybody who wasn't listening, because I a top one person watching right now um was that i broke up with my ex in 2010 and he said he had always wanted to be friends after we read the percy jackson books together so right after we broke up the percy jackson movie was releasing and i looked up the date it was almost exactly when i started dating jake so um <laughs> yeah so i already kind of had a thing with my husband. I was breaking up with this high school sweetheart. And my thought process was we're going to be friends, like he said. And so I'm going to invite him to go watch Percy Jackson. He said no, totally. Or he ghosted me. He didn't even say no. And that's why I never saw the first movie when it first came out. Now, to contextualize time again, by the time the third movie had come out, not only was I dating Jake already, but like, William was born already. I was gonna say William had to be born by that time. Yeah, William was six months old. So we went from me breaking up with my high school sweetheart to me having a whole six six month old newborn. <laughs> you know, like, um, and in 2013, it looks like they probably got very overshadowed in the box office because the worldwide like top earning movie that year was Frozen. And Frozen was such a big phenomenon for like Disney, for princesses, for Pixar. Like it was everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, and also to contextualize, they were nominated for a bunch of awards for the first movie, nominated, didn't get any of the actual awards for Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, but for Sea of Monsters, there was, I think there was only a nomination for the girl who played Clarice. And um, so it looks like Lightning Thief made 226.5 million in the box office with a 49% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And Sea of Monsters only made 200 million um, rounding, you know, and 42% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because like, Everybody already knew Rick's opinion at this time. Like, uh, I think what I saw, I saw this on the Wikipedia page. I'm sure you could probably actually dig up the old post because I know you you were actually watching for stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But Rick had said something to the effect of, "If you don't see something promoted on my website, then that means that I don't I don't fuck with it." So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was very obvious how he felt before the first movie came out much less that there was another one that was coming out. Yeah, and um, with this second one, I it's so hard to say this, and I know I said this last time, it's a shocker, but the second one is even less true to the book than the first one. So considering that the first one that was already off the rails was more true to the book, this one was just, yeah. I don't even know like where to start because it's just so stupid <laughs> and yeah. like and it's just the thing that i think is so weird about it is that clearly the guy who wrote this movie who i looked him up because i was like what the fuck is wrong with you he is one of the people who wrote the green lantern movie <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't know what that is that's become like a weird part of like brian reynolds like him just existing as himself but it was this god awful superhero movie that ryan reynolds did way back in the day and and it like kind of killed his career for a while and when he came back and did deadpool like the first deadpool movie makes fun of green lantern like their entire like marketing campaign was making fun of green lantern because that movie was so bad 
<laughs> and so I was like, oh, like I knew that you were a bad writer, but the thing I think is like almost disturbing is that the guy who wrote this clearly actually took the time to read the book. Yeah. Because there are certain scenes where he like is verbatim quoting the book and I'm like, why would you read the book and then do this? Like I yeah. like at least if you didn't read the book and just read like a Wikipedia like or like some assistant of yours came up with like a synopsis, I could at least say that. But like he took the time to actually know the source material and then did all of this stuff. And I'm just like, this is so weird that you would why did you why <laughs> i just yeah i just don't get it and especially um the mytho magic like twitter account and then also i see them on threads um their mytho magic is the production company that rick riordan has for all of his like stuff and whoever runs that account is like someone who's a friend of his that also you know works with him but it's okay. a friend of his. <laughs> and so he gives like good insight about things if you're wondering about stuff ever. But he said something about, he was responding to somebody else talking about Sea of, like the TV show, Sea of Monsters, and was basically saying like, we don't want to give too many things away. He's like, that kind of thing happened with the movies where they like killed off Kronos <laughs> in the second movie. But even though, Fox was expecting there to be more movies after that. Yeah. They like didn't want to have to wait. And he was like, we're like pacing ourselves with like the storylines and the action and whatever that we're doing because we don't want to do that. And I was just like, yeah, why? Th they thought that there would be more movies after that. And they, and they killed off the villain. Yeah. Well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So like <laughs> to start out, they, um, they show that they know the books immediately by going into that background scene of Talia and Luke and Annabeth arriving at camp. And that feels totally inconsequential to the rest of the movie because they don't overly emphasize that the tree is Talia. The poisoning scene is so minuscule. And then like we, we barely hear, like I don't think we hear anything else about Talia throughout the rest of the movie. Maybe that it was a Cyclops that attacked them, but that's it. I'm laughing because the thing that we hear, we do like eventually Annabeth in the movie says something about Thalia and the whole like Cyclops thing. First off, the Cyclops being the thing that attacked them at camp, I was just like, that's not what happened, <laughs> but okay whatever that's like small when it comes to this movie but it's just like an annoying little detail that they like didn't want to take the time to explain anything further so they just literally made a cyclops be the one attacking them at the camp mm -hmm. it also was like this is not this flashback part but it was beyond hilarious to me how they made the like magical barrier look like look like a piece of glass <laughs> that yeah could, like, Oh, and be gone I was just like I'm dying that this is how you guys are like picturing this but the most that they did is that they made the actress who played Annabeth walk around holding a pe like a pine cone like stick in her hand and I just died every time she would look at that and like they were trying to make her act as if it was like this painful thing and I was like somebody make it stop <laughs> You're making her stand there and look at this stupid stick from a pine tree. That's like the only thing you can think of to make an actress feel, oh my God, that was just so ridiculous. But even beyond that, the flashback, I was like, why is Annabeth like 17 years old <laughs> in, in like this flat? She's way too old. Even like the actress, even the older ages they are in this, in the movies, I was like, she's still too old. Yeah, so I was like, why? Why are they all so old? Well, they like, they age them equally, right? And we've said that that's a problem because it takes out the loop kind of being more manipulative because he's older aspect. Yeah. Um, so they age them all equally in that flashback, and then like that sets the scene for Talia growing up as a tree, which like, um. I, I guess whatever Zeusy magic, you know, turned her into a tree instead of her dying could potentially do that. 
but I'm pretty sure the way the books lays it out is that she's the same age when she pops out, right? Like she didn't age during those years. No, she does age in a weird way, um, but it's not like natural. One to one. one, to yeah. one. Like when she was, when she like died, or however you want to put that, she was like 12. And <laughs> when she wakes up, she is about to turn 16. And it, like eventually she she gets right before is right before she would turn 16 by the end of the story and so she is in like as a tree much longer than that amount of than like four years mm -hmm. or like you know seven or eight years or something like that by the time she is free um so it's not like a one-to-one -one aging thing she does like somehow age but it's one of just those weird things that they that I think is best for Rick to never actually explain. Yeah. Uh, but she does age, but it's not like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can really say? So, yeah, so we have them showing the flashback. We have them aging up the prophecy pretty early on, too, of saying it's like the prophecy is going to happen when you're 23. Um, which, yeah, again, like it changes the stakes of the entire storyline to make them adultish, you know, um, whether it be very old teenagers in the first film or very young adults in this film. It's definitely way different. Why the fuck are they at a summer camp? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. why, are you, why are you here, sir? <laughs> yeah, you should be having jobs. Like, yeah. <laughs> why are you here? Um, but really, like, it, it totally. I don't think that they spend enough time even to make a choice like that to flesh it out of like, okay, these people are old enough that they should be in college, they should have jobs. Like, is there drinking here? Is there sex here? Who knows? Because it's just not fleshed out very well. And I mean, they do have the flexibility to do that somewhat because they are only at camp for a very short time in this movie. Um, you know, they've already done the job of introducing what camp is in the first one, but I don't, I don't know, like when you consider that this Logan Lerman is supposed to be approaching 23, it's like, what is this? It's so stupid. It is. Yeah. It's all so dumb. And like the voiceover thing, I was like, you're trying to sound like Rick Riordan and it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what, it was like trying to sound like you were making a point, but I'm like, I don't know who this is because Percy doesn't talk like this weird <laughs> way. It's just... <sighs> like the beginning part of the movie where they do the whole climbing wall thing, but change the climbing wall in a strange way, <laughs> like take away the fact that in the books it has lava on it, but instead it makes it like a weird obstacle course thing, <laughs> like, whatever, fine. Um, for like, you know, 35 seconds, they, you could like make the argument that Percy was somewhat in character to actual Percy because, he, you know, jumps down to save someone, I forget who, who is falling. Um, and because of that, he doesn't win. But then that immediately ends as soon as he starts talking and you find out that he is the weakest little baby bitch in the entire world. And his entire storyline is, oh, Clarice is better at all of these things than me. I'm so jealous that she gets to go on all of these quests and I don't get to go. And I'm a one hit wonder. And my dad doesn't talk to me. And why won't anybody pay it? I will punch you. <laughs> like, he's yeah. the most, like, pathetic human being ever. Like, are you kidding? Like, there's, there's so many things wrong with how they present quests anyway. Like, they act like they're just like going on like a fun vacation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, they're like trying not to get murdered <laughs> the entire time they're on these quests. They're like, people are genuinely afraid to go on them because they're traumatic and scary. And, but they act like it's like just fun things to do. Yeah. But I just died when I realized that his entire arc for this movie is that he is jealous that everybody likes Clarice more because she is able to do all these things that he can't do and is like crying about that. And I was just like, this is supposed to be Percy? Like actual Percy would be fine with that. 
he would be good. He would be so happy with Clarice being able to do everything. Like the, the idea that he wants to go on the quest because he's jealous that she gets to do everything and he doesn't get to do anything. I'm like, why are you such a little dick? <laughs> like, I don't even know what to say. It was just so pathetic, especially when he was like, dad, why won't you talk to me? And I'm like, because you're a baby. Mm -hmm. You're more immature than 13 year old Walker Scobell, the actor, not even the character that he's playing. <laughs> like at this point, what is going on? <laughs> and what is with Clarice? Like having gone on all these quests, first of all, but then second of all, the fact that Annabeth and Grover can't keep straight, which ones were Percy and which ones were Clarice. Like, that is not in character for them at all either. Yeah, like the thing, the overarching like thing with this movie that was so weird is I generally don't know why anyone likes anybody. Like, I don't know why they would want to be friends with Grover because he's an asshole to them. Mm -hmm. And just makes, it basically makes fun of them to their face and acts like he's joking. And I'm like, who hurt this person where he thinks that this is like how you talk to your friends? But like none of them are like nice to each other and i generally don't know why any of them actually care about any of them like i don't know why percy would care about grover or vice versa i don't know why he would care about annabeth i don't i don't know why because they're all jerks yeah to each other all the time and i'm like why 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 <laughs> well i mean they set up the flirty like will they won't they with annabeth in the first movie so maybe they thought like that's enough they have a crush on each other but yeah with grover the emotional stake of oh shoot i'm having nightmares about my best friend and my best friend is off with some cyclops and this seems to be real what the hell are these dreams like that was the pull of trying to save grover the entire time in the book of sea of monsters Mm -hmm. They didn't set up anything remotely similar to that by having Grover there in the beginning and get kidnapped mid-quest. And he's he's just so annoying. He's like, oh, Percy's gonna kick up, gonna get kicked out of camp. And he's just like making fun of him yeah. for doing something. And then like, just, I will never get over how they make Clarice like the like, number one person at camp and that Percy's reaction to it is being like threatened or like upset by it like mm -hmm. deserve to get punched in the throat for being like a stereotypical man yeah like Rick Riordan would like cry himself to sleep if he saw his character hopefully he's never actually had to see any of that <laughs> see yeah. like his character being depicted that way because that's just so not that's so not him and it's just like so strange to just that whole back and forth of like, oh, Clarice is obviously number one, but I'm upset about that because I'm a man and I, because there's no other reason why. It's like, why do you care about that? Like, and just the way they talk about the first quest of, oh, well, you saved your mom at least. And it's like, are you like downplaying the fact that he went to the underworld and saved his mother and the entire world because he only did it one time? Like, who? Are you supposed to be his best friend? <laughs> And you're talking to him this way like and then like right after that is when Chiron is just like oh you're supposed to die soon mm -hmm. I'm just gonna tell you in the most nonchalant way possible yeah. and in the way that is like so uncaring just go up there and talk to this like Oracle that we've now remembered exists in this movie and I'm not gonna like warn you about what she's gonna say just go up there and hear her say that your soul is supposed to be reaped yeah, not only am I not going to warn you what I'm going to say, but right before he has this line of like, if you come back sane, like, so, you know, he might go crazy seeing this mummified oracle, and yet you send him in there just like that. Okay, you know, like, it made more sense in the first movie, because he didn't understand the world and like, yeah, it would be shocking. But now that he understands the world, not giving him a heads up of like, hey, we have a mummy that's going to talk to you. <laughs> like, that, that's, that should have been it. And like the, the fact that he, he comes out of there and he hears, you have, to make a, you have to make a choice and whatever choice you make is going to either kill everyone or save everybody. And also, you're probably going to die at the end of it because your soul is supposed to be reaped by a sword or whatever. 
The one like tiniest thing from this movie that just bothered me for reasons is that the sword is like Poseidon's. Like it has like Poseidon, and I'm like, that's not his. I was like, every like we haven't read like Titan's Curse again, but every single time he would look at the sword in like this meaningful way, and he would see like Poseidon's. I was like, that is Zoe's sword. That's not Poseidon's mm-hmm. sword. That's her sword. Stop it. Like you're messing, like it's such like a small thing, but I'm like, it's not even his, it's not even his dad's sword. So none of this makes any sense. And you read these books, apparently, at least this one, so you would know enough to know that it's not actually his dad's sword, whatever. But it's more just, he comes out of that and he's just like, anyway, I'm just going to move on with my life. He has like no reaction. Yeah, the only thing was raised with a Z, I asked. Like, you're going to ask the Oracle a question? Like, that happens, sure. It's like if I called, like, my favorite restaurant and they were, like, out of the food that I wanted. That's how he responds to them being like, you're going to be stabbed to death. Yeah. And it's just, like, I know this would happen in the first movie, but I'm just like, what the, this is a different director. It's not Christopher Columbus. It's a different guy. But I'm like, I don't know what was going on on the sets of these movies that like these actors that I've seen in other things that I know can act while they do this movie are just like, I don't care. <laughs> just, yeah. It's so weird. Um, have we gotten to when they introduced Tyson yet? We're getting there. <laughs> but like one more note on Annabeth and Clarice before we get there is that they gave Annabeth all of the toughness and I'm going to bully Percy in the first movie, right? Um, they gave her those characteristics that were Clarice's when they put her against him in Capture the Flag. This movie, what the heck is Annabeth? Like, I, it feels like we can only have one tough girl, so it's going to be Clarice. And Annabeth, she can still fight and stuff, but we're just going to suck out her personality and all of the color from her hair. <laughs> she's going to be blonde because that will fix everything to do with Annabelle. And she's going to also be like the weakest version of Annabeth ever. Like somebody who sits there and is... <laughs> Sorry, someone left a comment saying that they're laughing at the pain on my face. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I just was the whole time I was watching it. I wish I could have like seen my own face when I was watching it, just being like, "What do I don't even know?" But yeah. Annabeth, like, I can't imagine Annabeth sitting there and like consoling Percy and being like, "I'm sorry that Clarice is so much better than you," and trying to make him feel better about that. Yeah, instead of like punching him in the throat, like. <laughs> <laughs> Get your shit together, bro. Like, what are you talking about right now? You're a Poseidon child and you're like crying and whining because another girl at this camp is also capable at her job. Isn't that a good thing? Because less people will die. Why are you upset about that? Yeah. (laughs) And so just the fact that she does that and it also um, absolutely killed, killed me that that they have Annabeth just like come up with the whole quest idea herself using like a weird version of an iPad. (laughs) And she's just like, oh, we can do this to save camp as if like no one else at this stupid camp who's an adult would have thought of any of that. It's just like, oh, me, teenage age unknown, me is going to like shove this iPad in, in, their face and I'm gonna come up with it. And it's just the fact that like Chiron in in this movie is like, well, the tree's gonna die and everyone in here is also gonna die. And I'm just gonna sit here and let this happen. <laughs> that's just how he responds. I'm just, I yeah. <laughs> and for adaptations that are supposed to be more comedic, or at least that's how I see these movies is trying to play up the comedy more, taking out Tantalus like yeah. why you know it was weird he's like actually funny <laughs> i think william's knocking hold on okay <sighs> <sighs> 
<laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so they took away the physical comedy of Tantalus, which would have fit perfectly within these movies. They give Dionysus one scene where he's pouring out wine and it turns into water so that he could give that little clip about like, oh, they, you know, the Christians have a guy who could do this trick in reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a sidebar, but that's really funny because of what, did you hear about what happened at the Olympics opening ceremony? Yes. Okay. So I heard about it first via someone making a post of, oh yeah, the Olympics is totally atheist. We don't, we don't include religion, but we make fun of Christians. And I was just like, okay, I doubt they did that unfollow because um, I followed that person for their comedy. And um, then when I heard that it was actually the Olympians, I was like, are we, are we serious? Yeah, it was the Feast of Dionysus painting mm -hmm. about, I forget what the theme of it actually, what of that painting actually is, but it was something about like, humans shouldn't hurt each other kind of thing, mm -hmm. which is a very Olympic sort of thing. And the painting of that is in France. So it makes mm -hmm. sense why it would be that. Christians just are so egocentric that they just assumed that something that resembled the, La the Last Supper could only be the Last Supper and they thought it was about them. It was, it's not about you though. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not about Jesus. People usually don't reference Jesus and the Last Supper when they're in the middle of introducing like a worldwide sport event. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause that like, a lot of the world isn't Christian. So why would they do that? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. like. The Christian centrism sometimes just, it bugs the shit out of me. And I know a lot of world places will, like they have Christianity. It's just, that was dumb. Yep. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked up the original painting yet to actually see like, but yeah, it's, it's just so dumb that they always think everything's about them and completely forget while doing so that a lot of their traditions were ripped off of other people before yep. them. So, I mean, okay. yeah. Um, okay. So let's skip ahead to Tyson because I know we've talked about Tyson before when we were reading the books. Um, now like seeing his whole character laid out in the whole movie. Um, so yeah, they made him a stoner, surfer-esque kind of guy um that's kind of the personality type if you've seen any teen movie that's the stereotype he seems to be on even though it's not it's not exactly expressly said it's just like if you've seen the pattern enough you're like oh he's supposed to be a stoner kid um which is a weird way to rewrite somebody who clearly has intellectual <laughs> disabilities um you know I mean, we've, we've hit that point enough and, um, we, we did say we wanted someone with intellectual disabilities for Tyson, the actor, I, I feel like he looks like a good fit anyway, so we will give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like changing that whole aspect of Tyson's character was really strange. Yeah. And I, so the thing with that is like the only thing necessarily like wrong wrong with Tyson is the way that he looks and so like I don't know why they did that because everything else Tyson is how Tyson would be in this movie but I don't know why he's doing everything that he does in this movie for people who treat him like absolute garbage mm -hmm. like that's the thing about Tyson in this movie is he still cares a lot about Percy he still is wanting to be his brother he's still wanting to help everybody they make him like save not Percy when the when the like the bull attacks, which whatever. But other than that, everything else he does in the movie, he's like trying to help Percy and trying to be a good brother and wants to be like a nice person and like a nice monster and not do like all the stuff the book version of Tyson does. But Percy is an absolute asshole to him. And that I felt like I was watching like younger me who used to get treated horribly by the quote-unquote friends that I had when I was in middle school, especially. 
and would like do all these things for them because I was so desperate for like a friend while they treated me like garbage. Like I was like, he does all of this stuff for you and you hate him. Like when I watched it, I was like, do people like have people like projected movie Percy onto like book Percy? Is this why so many people say that book Percy is like mean to Tyson when book Percy never is because movie Percy is horrible to him. Yeah. He like, talks to him like he can't stand him. Like he's it's like how people talk to you when they're embarrassed to be around you and you won't and they and you won't get the hint to like go away and leave them alone. That's mm -hmm. every time he talks to him for the majority of the entire movie. And so like I'm like Tyson is great, but he needs to be free of these people. And yeah. so it's like I'm just like none most of the storylines that happen in the movie don't make any sense because like they do the whole storyline of um or at least they try to of like him and Annabeth but I'm like you don't need to have an entire storyline about why she's being so mean to Tyson because everyone is mean to Tyson yeah like, everybody is horrible to him it doesn't even stand out in this movie because yeah. Percy and Grover and Clarice and everyone at camp treats him the exact same way that Annabeth would. So there's like nothing, like, it feels weird for Percy to be like, oh, why don't you like him? And I was like, why don't you like him? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the show handles that because from what we read, it seems like all of the mean to Tyson stuff is in Percy's head. It's stuff that he says after interactions with, with Tyson or like while somebody else is talking about Tyson, he's like, well, I think these things too, but I'm not going to say them out loud. Um, it's very much that kind of vibe of he's almost mean to himself in the books because he's like, why do I feel these things? Tyson didn't do anything wrong. Tyson's a little sweet child. Like, um, you know, he, he very much understands that what he says and does affects Tyson very much. Um, and yeah, like, I, I feel like because we, we do get the beginning narration in the movie, but we get that taken away. Maybe that's why he seems meaner to Tyson in the, like, that's why they made him meaner to Tyson in the plot. The show also doesn't do narration, but I mm -hmm. I can see them playing the conflict that um, Walker's Percy has differently, for sure. It's just kind of hard to imagine how they'll do that. Maybe they'll have him confide in just one person, or I, I don't know. Like Yeah, well, like the whole thing with like book Percy that I'm imagining will happen with Walker's version of Percy is like he has no problem with Tyson, but everyone else is being so horrible to him because of Tyson. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's more of this idea that like camp is supposed to be this place that he feels accepted, mm -hmm. and, like understood and in a way that he never has before. And then he comes back and because Tyson's with him, suddenly everyone is treating him like he would be every day when he was at school. And he's yeah. back to like being bullied by everyone and not having any friends. And so there is a way a clear, like a good way to show that whole thing on screen of like being mad at the people that are bullying him and, and bullying Tyson and standing up for him the way that he does all the time, but also being like stressed out about it or like not understanding like why it's happening, um, especially because of the fact that Poseidon never talks to him and so he doesn't understand what his dad is doing and he's like why would you send a like a monster to camp with me when you know that this is how camp would respond to something like that like so that's very a very understandable thing because that is hard to like be the kid that's bullied all the time and then getting a break from that and then ending up in that position in a new place it's like you just you're like I don't want to do this anymore <laughs> and that's yeah. And that's basically what he feels. And like, I think that the show is generally going to do that because they put out since the new season is going to start filming in like two days, um, they put out like a little description, you know, thing for the second season. And one of the things is saying, you know, um, Percy's friendship with Annabeth is going to change this season. And like, we know that that's like 
not necessarily a good change. <laughs> like it's not a good change for the most of it. It's fine when they get to the end of it, but still it does change. And because most of the season, they're not getting along because of Tyson. Yeah. And so they're going to do that. But like the mo- this movie, like from the very start, the first time he sees Tyson, he is like, oh, you're gross. Yeah. I don't Everyone want to treat him with disgust, it feels like. Disgust is more the word that I would yeah. use rather than like, yeah. it's more contempt in the books. It's more like, oh, we don't want a Cyclops around here. And um, less so the disgust that he is with Cyclops. Yeah, I was like, you're, ew. I really don't like you. And especially like, even when they leave to like, go on to the stupid way that they like break out of camp which is not even breaking out of camp because people literally see them breaking out of camp and they just like don't do anything about it but when they decide to do that like from what i remember like tyson is just kind of going along with them they don't want him to go and like tyson or tyson um percy and and grover and stuff don't even want him to come Mm-hmm. And it's, but they decide to have him come because they are like, oh, the, he, he has to like argue on his own behalf. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, Polythemus is on the island with, with, um, with the Golden Fleece and he's like one of me. And so you should bring me because I, I will know how to deal with him. Yeah. They're like, fine. But it's like, <sighs> this is just so wrong that you read the book that these books were based this book was based on and turned tyson into basically the disabled kid that's being bullied by people that he thinks are his friends and he doesn't realize that they can't stand being around him yeah i hated it the entire movie i wanted him to just get away from them and like go back to camp and live on his own and this tyson looks so much more helpless like i it's gonna be harder because the actor is so much older for this show to make him look as helpless, but that's almost what the books presents him as, is he's this big sturdy guy that nobody he is so big and burly and like looks way older than he actually is. Nobody really realizes how soft he is because he is so big and burly and like looks way older than he actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, the show kind of did the opposite, where he looks small, he looks helpless. They made him ditzy. I, I guess was more the word that I would use than like Tyson. It it wasn't ditzy. I, I could tell you that it wasn't like cute and quirky. I don't know what's going on. Um, so yeah, it's it's very much a different dynamic from the start, and it's easier to like it's almost easier to pity Tyson in a way when he looks so pathetic. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and well, the thing that like really like hurt my feelings <laughs> and I was just like, this is such a horrible thing to put into a movie that might be geared towards kids. I generally still have absolutely no idea who they thought wanted to watch this, any of these movies because they don't make any sense for any of the people that you would think it yeah. was a <laughs> so I it's honestly still a mystery to me who they thought would watch these movies but um when Annabeth gives him like they have her have like mist as almost like a cologne or something yeah but spray on himself that like changes what he looks like so he stops looking like a monster and looks conventionally attractive mm-hmm. and Tyson is like like, yes, give this to me right now because you will be nicer to me if I look nicer. And like later on in the movie, when it starts wearing off, he's like really upset because he knows that they're gonna go back to being really mean to him. And I'm like, do do they understand like what they're even doing there? Like what they're even showing? No, because the way that they put it is like Tyson should wear this stuff. Yeah. And it's a better thing that he looks more attractive when he's wearing it and that everyone treats him much nicer. And there's no absolutely zero commentary about that at all. Like you're supposed to be upset that he doesn't look attractive at a certain point. And I'm just like, this is so horrible. Like this just made me so sad because 
<laughs> this is a whole like bigger conversation, but I can try to sum it up that when you are fat and I've been fat my entire life, like I, my mom brought pictures of us when we were kids and I literally could see like when I started to gain weight when I was seven. And that's not surprising when I know about things that happened in my life around that age. But when around between six and seven was when that started changing with me. And I've been overweight ever since then. And people don't look at you when you're fat. They don't pay attention to you. They treat you like less than human. They treat you like garbage. Mm -hmm. like, I will, I would, I don't, there's a lot of reasons why I don't like going outside my apartment. But one of them, honestly, is that when you go out in the world, when you are overweight, or there's nothing wrong with saying the word fat, but you know, um, people like you can sometimes notice when people are staring at you and they just look disgusted by you. Like I have, I have seen people doing that towards me multiple times, like so many times throughout my life, even as an adult, they do that. And one of the things that fucks with your head the most when is that when you lose weight, people stop doing that. People then are like nice to you and they'll hold the door open for you or there's, or they'll like compliment your clothes or whatever, which is why I don't want to lose weight. I got like so stressed out when one of my aunts told me recently and that she thought I lost weight because I don't want to lose weight because I don't want anyone looking at me when I do actually leave the house. Leave me alone. Yeah. Leave me alone. Like, I don't want anyone paying attention to me. And every time I've ever lost weight, I've always gained it back when people start being nicer to me because it's like, oh, you can be nice to me. You're just choosing not to because of because you think that I'm not conventionally attractive enough to treat me like a human being. Got it. Like, got it. And that's basically what's happening with him in this whole movie. But the movie is telling you that you're supposed to want him to do that. And it's just like, this is so messed up that Annabeth is like, you're so ugly. Fix it so I don't have to look at you. Yeah. And I'm like, this is supposed to be Anna Annabeth and... Percy and Grover are supposed to be the people doing this. Yeah. Also, like, they keep having Grover make jokes about sex. Like, can you st stop? Again, traditional satyr. Like, that is satyr behavior, but it's not Grover behavior. <laughs> you know? Grover <laughs> is very much an aged down, unsexified satyr in the books. So, um, you know, like, it's it's so weird. Uh, I, thought, I thought the Percy Jackson stuff would be, like, one thing where I wouldn't have to worry that people would all of a sudden start talking about sex and I would have to figure out if it would be, like, too much for me or not. So I was like, just go away. Like, this is supposed to be a break for for me not have to worry about any of this shit. Stop, yeah. stop it. Especially when it's Grover, who's, like, the most empathetic, like, loving person when he's just being like Grover, like when he's actually being in character, he yeah, would yeah. never talk about people that way. Yeah, um, well, I feel like what they did with the whole spray mist too, like it breaks the rules of what the mist is. I mean, the, the mist is kind of one of those deus ex machina kind of things that Rick pulls out every once in a while where, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have concrete rules, but we have never encountered anything in the books, to my knowledge at least, where you have to spray somebody for the mist to work on the mortals. No, it just works. Like, there is something that comes up in Titan's Curse where there's a way that you can, like, learn to manipulate the mist. Like, that's a whole thing where, like, Ty uh, Tyson, no, where Chiron teaches Thalia how to do that and never teaches Percy how to do that. Mm -hmm. One of those scapegoat things that happens in Titan's Curse when he realizes, like, I've been at camp way longer than you and he already taught you how to do this, which would make your life a lot better when you're out on a quest, but he never took the time to teach me. Um, but that's still like them using like their powers. And there are some kids that have part of their like God parent like powers is that they can manipulate the mist easier to make them see something that's not there so that they don't notice when they're doing things that would usually attract their attention. But it's just like something that is everywhere. Like <laughs> one of the things I love about um, Sally and Paul, um, 
is that in the last book when the huge fight is happening, they're like running around New York City with guns, like trying to fight monsters and Paul can't even see them. <laughs> but he's still out there trying because he wants to protect Percy because he's the best father figure for Percy and for most other characters, honestly, he's great. He's like the one father figure that's great <laughs> in, yeah, yeah. in like this series, but he can't see anything that he's actually like doing. <laughs> so he's still very confused, but it's not like something that you can just like, like apply to you. It's just like part of the world. It just, yeah. is um, I got like the general idea of how this like psychotic writer came up with that because of the ways that they can manipulate it in future books. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the most vapid, like, way like i could just like picture like influencers doing ads for something like that <laughs> of like you could use the mist to do to manipulate the mist to do so many different things to like help so many people but you're using it in this movie to make somebody look nicer to look at and that's the only thing you're using it for because i don't know what else you would use mist that you can spray from a bottle for besides something like that yeah, it would have to be something cosmetic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can totally see, what is it, Michaela, Mik I always forget her last name, Michaela Neguera? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah like Flashgate, you totally just spray mist on your eyelashes and then you... This is the best setting spray I've ever used, or those other words that I don't understand that they all say with like their crazy, like fake accents where they're just screaming. like. I don't know why people on TikTok think that if they scream, I'm going to watch their videos. That makes, if you, if you, if I see your videos too often and every time you make them, you're screaming, I just block you because you're screaming <laughs> and I don't want to listen to that, to that anymore. Or if you're always angry, that's, yes, another, one that that's another thing. Sometimes they're like, there's a really nice, like leftist creator that's an attorney, but she like talks really loud on like purpose. Like that's her whole, like way of speaking in all of her videos. And she says like things that are like good to know, but I can't watch any of her videos. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you're triggering my PTSD. I'm, re I'm really, I'm really sorry about that. But I don't think my PTSD is ever gonna get good enough that I can hear somebody talking really loudly like that. And like, even if they're just passionately talking about something that they care about, I just can't, I just can't do it. I can't concentrate on anything you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we got the spray mist. Um, they skip over the Hydra scene, which I can't remember if there's a Hydra scene in the first book, and maybe that's why they were like, we already did a Hydra. Let's not do a Hydra. Um, because they did fight a Hydra in the first movie. I guess they just, that is so weird that they did that. I wouldn't even mention that that they did that, but it's just so strange that they had a Hydra in the first movie where there isn't one and took out the scene where there is one in the second movie that has the whole donut. Yeah, they donut. took out the monster donuts thing. They took out the encounter with Hermes and then placed it in a fake UPS. So- oh, Yeah, and like right after, is this, was this before they like randomly kidnapped um, Grover? I think it was like either right before or right after. Like, it was right after because I, I'm pretty sure they go in there to be like, we need to find Luke because he just kidnapped. Yeah, yeah. That and um, first off, the fact that scene where they like take Grover, it's so stupid that they're like, oh, was that Chris Rodriguez? Like, and I didn't say this, but earlier when the bulls attack camp. And Chris Rodriguez is like, I'm just gonna stay here. I'm like, yeah, everybody's <laughs> running and he's like, I'm good. Um, that's not suspicious to you guys. I'm just gonna stay here and keep eating and finishing my food because that's it, that seems relevant. <laughs> especially because they're later like, oh, someone must have let this bull in. But the bull <laughs> busted through the glass dome that they had over camp. <laughs> like nobody let that bull in. That bull crashed it. <laughs> It was just like, oh, this is so dumb. And like, you, he doesn't even do anything. Like, there's no reason for him to even. He's just sitting there eating when it, like, how did he let it in while he's sitting there eating? There's no like bigger point really for him to be, 
this is like obviously skipping way ahead to the end, but there is no reason for Chris Rodriguez to even be a character in this movie. Mm-hmm. Because his character is supposed to be like someone from camp who joins Luke's side and turns against everybody. What the fuck is the point of that if you're going to have Luke get eaten at the end of this movie and be dead? And yeah. so anything that Luke was doing is done. So why the fuck are you like having him be the weirdest person while eating lunch and helping kidnap Grover and being in like one other scene? But it's like, you don't need to name him. He could just be like some nameless, faceless. Like, <laughs> sorry, tell me in my comments. The faces of grief in this live. <laughs> okay, wait, no, because I want to see if you caught what I was. I was waiting for you to pick up on. So they get into Luke's yacht, right? Yeah, yeah. They get into Luke's yacht via hippocampi. I'm pretty sure. And um, in Luke's yacht, they gave away something that is not until the fifth books. Did you catch it? I don't remember anymore. By that point, I was so annoyed that I was, okay. still, I was like, not like, I was like, not, it was not like, what, what was it? So in the, in, when they get into the ship, Annabeth immediately is like, there's Chris Rodriguez and Selena Beauregard. And oh, Selena, yeah, Selena, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I like heard them say her last name and I was just like, what? Why would you give that up so easily? Because that, like, especially if you did think there were going to be more movies, that is a huge plot point later on that she was a spy all along. So you like, need her to be at camp. Why the fuck is Selena on a yacht? <laughs> like, yeah. She's supposed to be at camp. So why, why is she on this yacht? <laughs> I just, the whole thing with, like, Grover being taken just killed me. Like, the whole, so... Kermie is being Nathan Phil- Philan? I, I, I always say his name wrong. I, I don't know his last name, yeah. He's an asshole. Um, he's somebody who, like, I'm not gonna like, it's hard for me to like people who are, are stars of Joss Whedon things that don't, like, denounce Joss Whedon anyway, but he's somebody who, like, when Me Too stuff started happening, some people came forward about him doing some nice, not nice things. So I was like, oh, I hate you. Like, I, I liked, in, in like 2013, when these movies originally came out, if I was like, for some reason, I, <laughs> sorry, I was gonna say, if I hated my, I did hate my life in 2013. I don't even remember when this movie came out because that was a crazy, like, ass year of my life. 2013 was when, um, my sister and her boyfriend broke up two months after I moved into an apart- a new apartment with, with, with them. Like we moved, we lived with him for many years. We moved into a new place and then two months later they break up in like June. And we have to move in with my mom who just moved out of a three bedroom place that she was living in with, with my dad, who had just finally gotten into a nursing home after he was in the hospital with cancer for a couple months and she had just moved from a three bedroom place to a one bedroom and we have to move in with her for the next year in a one bedroom place instead of the three bedroom place where all of us would have our own rooms and so i don't know what the hell i i I honestly hardly remember that year at all because it was just too much um so i generally don't i remember knowing that this movie came out and not wanting to go see it but i generally didn't want to do anything at all that year so that's not that surprising i like would like leave the house to like escape living being like by my mom and my sister and like would see my friends sometimes but i was so so depressed uh all the time and that that was before my dad died (laughs) in like the next year so things were like absolutely wild then so i wouldn't have watched this movie anyway but especially if i did i just i don't know what the fuck was happening like why they would give away everything so much and like the so like the Hermes stuff like nathan fillion being the actor now i was like i know that you're an asshole now in a horrible way and i don't want to watch you in this role but at least it's not it's not that long i guess he's only in that one scene and never comes back but the one thing that bothered me what that i mentioned to you was george and martha Mm -hmm. Um, they i couldn't find who played their voices i tried to look it up um but i couldn't find it but their voices sounded like people trying to talk with like a black scent 
like you know that way that people yeah can... martha kind of has like a southern black scent and then george is more like a b e kind of yeah and they're and at one point hermes is, is like trying to they're like you want me to hiss for these people and i don't want to do it that's a harmful like offensive stereotype and i was like are you making fun of of marginalized people for pointing out that there's harmful stereotypes about how they talk and how they act because yeah. it sounds it sounded very much because they were very much putting them as if they were being annoying by bringing that up mm -hmm. and i was like everyone who made this movie is white um yeah. this is uncomfortable as fuck and like in 2013 was when Tr trayvon martin was killed in like 2011 or 2012. yeah and so that was around the time when people would make jokes like that and like thought that they were being funny and i was just like this is really fucked up that in this movie that you're making a joke like that with snakes anyway like this is really like making fun of people for being upset about things like that it was already bad enough um but then also the fact that Luke only has a yacht is funny, <laughs> since in the books he has like a whole cruise ship, but also genuinely, genuinely, does Luke or anyone else who know him have a brain? Because if you kidnapped Grover, why would you be surprised they're on your ship? Why are you surprised that they're there? I just kidnapped your friend. What are you doing chasing them? What do you mean you're surprised that the- Of course they're there! You just kidnapped your their friend and they're coming to find their friend. What are you talking about? And then the whole fact that they like throw- Okay, when they like show them in like the brig room or whatever mm -hmm. on like the boat. I just, in my head, you are on a boat. You are the son of Poseidon. You are on a boat. Why did you let them throw you in here? You are on a boat! <laughs> Especially because this Percy magically knows how to throw water like a fucking waterbender. Like, why didn't you fight? You were on a boat! Why didn't you just use the water to literally fling all of them off of the boat? <laughs> like, I... Oh my gosh. Yeah, okay, this is jumping ahead a little bit too, but how they get off the boat? How they distract Luke from that? How the fuck is Luke surfing? I don't know. That was the other thing. I was like, you can't. When I was watching this, they could have easily put some Maya sandals on him. Like when I was, I would just like think things in my head. I was as I was watching this, and that part, I was just like, you can't physically do that. I had to rewind it because I'm like, is he wearing? Is he wearing the shoes? Because that would make sense if he was wearing the shoes. No. How is he doing that? He's like, you don't have, you don't have water power, sir. Like you can't. Yes. You can't just jump. Like if I jumped off of a boat onto a wave, I would just crash into the ocean and go swimming. Like yeah. you can't. The Percy's the only one that can do that. <laughs> so I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. If that actually works, though, like just getting in someone's slipstream in the water and you're taking off <laughs> on your feet, like that would be really cool. But no, um... no, I would never get out of the water if all I had to do was like stand be in water with somebody else and then become jesus like that would be that would be really great and yeah. it was just it also like absolutely destroyed like my soul that um that like annabeth is like you know being bitchy of course to tyson when they're trying to get away and she uses like the wind and when percy gets into like the boat with them she he like says something to her like oh that was so smart of you and i was like are you sure <laughs> like are you sure that it's really smart of her to use wind when she when you're on the ocean in a boat and you don't have a motor and but also why are you using you just made a bunch of waves yeah. so why do you even need the wind just use water just use water <laughs> like, I don't, like, wasn't there something cartoony where it was actually a thing where someone stuck out the back end of a boat and they were paddling? I'm, I can't remember. I'm getting a cartoony image, but I don't remember what it is. Also on the boat, it was like way too kung, kung fu movie for me. Like the way that they were fighting, I was like, this is Percy Jackson. Like these kids wear like jeans and t-shirts 
while they're saving the world they're not they don't actually they know how to fight with like swords but they don't actually know kung fu <laughs> or like or karate or any of that stuff they don't know how to actually fight like that because this isn't like an action movie like that and so the fact that they were like fighting like that at all on the boat i'm like this is so weird and the way that like why Percy decided to stand on like his roof, which is where that line came from of get off of my roof, I guess. Um, why he's standing on the roof, I'm not really sure either. I was just like, why are you up there? And like, it felt like he was trying to distract so that they could leave. But once again, why not use your water powers to use waves to push them away yourself <laughs> instead of standing on a roof like a fucking idiot? Yeah. Well, everyone just stares at you and it's like, what are you doing <laughs> before you remember? Oh yeah, I have water powers. <laughs> well, and I get why people love that moment because it is such a real, it's like <laughs> such a break in the pacing and everything for him to just be like, get off my fucking roof, kid. Yeah, it is like a funny, it is like it's a funny line. So I got why people liked it. Yeah. But also that will never happen. <laughs> yeah, they won't do it on Disney. But it, I could, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, but they wouldn't do it just for Rick, probably. The, um, the, myth, the Mytho Magic like Twitter account has said, like, no, we're never doing that. We're never doing anything that came from any of the movies because I think Rick Riordan would turn into the Hulk. <laughs> yeah. If they even tried, they would, no. I can't even imagine how much pain he feels remembering these movies. If I feel like I'm dying watching them and I'm not the one who made any of these characters up about my wife and me and my kids, <laughs> like yeah. such a personal story that somebody just like bastardized. But also the fact that they just like, sh that Luke is just like, here, look at this sarcophagus that I have. Don't you think it's really interesting that I'm bringing back Kronos's body somehow in this sarcophagus and telling you my entire plan? Isn't that a great thing that I'm doing as a villain? <laughs> it's like, it's what such God? a villain stereotype. It's like Bond villain esque, you know? Like, where at least have like, have peach. like in the books, Percy has a scary nightmare about it. And he still doesn't understand what the fuck that is. Like, he does, like, they don't actually understand the whole sarcophagus thing for like two books. They don't really know what that is until like Battle of the Labyrinth somewhere, I think. Yeah. Um, and so it's just like one of those confusing things that they see and they don't know what it means, but they know that it's something scary. But in this, he's literally just telling him his entire plan. And I'm just like, what? I generally don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> why you are so stupid that you're just telling him your entire thing. Like, what do you, what do you mean? It's bad writing. It's, sh it's tell not show, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole movie is bad writing, so we can't really be that surprised. But um, anyway, so they speed off from Luke um, via the winds, which just seem to work like a jet almost. I mean, it's, it's weird because they lost their motor, but then they're using these winds that seem like they would have only been as powerful as the motor. You have all four winds locked up, but they're only like a little jet stream. Okay. Um, you know, like Percy could go way faster on his own. Sure. Um, oh, and before we leave the, the yacht scene, um, the way that they represented Percy being able to navigate, I don't know how to feel about that. Cause in one respect, giving yeah. a visual aspect is interesting, but in another respect, like we know from reading it that Percy was just as confused of I suddenly know exactly where we are <laughs> like and so yeah for him to see it on grid lines and understand it doesn't really I don't know it doesn't have the same magic for me that it does of just I know the exact point we're at and on the world right now <laughs> yeah that this movie has like zero nuance and so they would just like have him literally seen a bunch of lines on the ocean as a way for him to figure it out because it's not like this Percy has a brain. Yeah. So it's not like he could figure it out any other way anyway. He's, I mean, if he thinks that Annabeth is really smart because she remembered to use wind when they're on the ocean trying to get away from another boat, um, something's wrong here. <laughs> yeah, like that is, that is an aspect of the here. <laughs> yeah. Like that is that is an aspect of the Odyssey that has been borrowed 
from multiple different things, right? Um, like even the SpongeBob adaptation, the SpongeBob movie has a little bit of an Odyssey feel to it, mm -hmm. and that they have a bag of wins. So you know, like it's it's a very well known aspect in mythology. But okay, going away from the ship. I am mad at what they did mythologically here because they immediately put them in Charybdis's mouth. And um, like, I do like the visual aspect of Annabeth being like, oh wait, are these sharks? And then they realize slowly they're not sharks, they are teeth. And um, I like that visually, but what I don't like about the mythological aspect of taking away Scylla as another like monster here is that it's famously a choice. It's famously a rock and a hard place choice that all of these heroes that go on the sea of monsters have to make. Um, you either have to risk getting people get grabbed by Scylla or you have to risk your ship going too close to Charybdis. And so they took away that they took away Clarice's development of her being so um, like it's her hubris of I'm going to take on Charybdis and I'm going to defeat Charybdis. Um, mm -hmm. And then they just immediately have her in Charybdis's belly and that's how they meet back up. Yeah, and also it felt like a weird mix of, I don't, obviously I don't know all the mythology, so I don't know if there are stories of people being inside Charybdis or not, but it felt like they were more inspired by like Moby Dick yeah and that sort of a story where you're inside the giant creature and trying to get out and so i was like this is also none of this happened in the book like i don't mean to be one of those people but nothing even close to this happens and it's such a strange thing to like take out so many things that do happen in the book that have like an actual purpose for it and make like the story better and instead do this entire long sequence where they're like inside of Trivdis and they find Clarice in there, which means that she also failed mm -hmm. and they somehow find a way out. But it's just so weird that they even spent all of that time figuring all of, just wasting so much time on yeah. this weird sequence that was not in the original story. So I like, don't know why, why they did that. Um, which I guess could be like the whole thing for this whole movie is I don't know why they did that. Well, it seems to me that the goal was to have it be this magical moment where Percy and Clarice have to work together and the power of friendship, you know, and that's what they were going for. Um, the thing is, you don't lose that by going with the original story. In fact, you gain it a little bit more deeply because I mean, another scene we skipped over in this movie is Aries getting mad at Clarice and saying like, look, girly, you gotta, you gotta win this quest. You gotta win for me. Um, and Percy recognizing like, oh shit, she's abused just like me. That was more Clarice Percy development that could have happened. But like, I know they'll give it to us in the show. I know that Rick is not going to mess like Rick and Disney are not going to mess up on giving us that moment because it is so much more fulfilling then you know like this really cheesy like let's give charybdis a tummy ache <laughs> let's give him ibs that, <laughs> that sounds like a great idea um and also like didn't they change who the people on the ship were like i don't think that they were um they did say confederate or because percy refers to them as zombies and then she says um, something like they prefer dead Confederate soldiers who gave their life to Ares. <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I remember in this now because when I was watching this movie, I'm like, wow, are there any people on in this entire movie that aren't white? And the only person that I remember seeing is when they're in like the taxi, they show like an ad of like Ganymede. And for oh, some yeah. reason, Ganymede what? is a black man. And I was like, oh, that's one person. And I'm pretty sure that's it. Well, one of the Grey sisters is very clearly played by a POC actor, actress, but like, it's really funny because they give in, oh no, you didn't line to one who wasn't that one. And also like Chris Rodriguez is the most white bro. And I'm like, your last name is Rodriguez. <laughs> and he looks, and I know like, obviously I know that 
just because of the way you look doesn't mean anything about like what your racial or ethnic background is but it was just like more like his name is literally chris rodriguez you didn't change that into something else you should have cast someone who wasn't like just a, a generic frat boy if you're going to have him in this movie for no reason whatsoever that's uh, like 30 <laughs> like he looks super old <laughs> it's just so stupid that they have them do this whole thing and that um and i remember after that part being like oh tyson didn't die um because of course nobody listens to a fucking word he says and they're too busy during that part thinking that he's so ugly that nobody wants to look at him that they don't even bother to have him do anything helpful um that i can remember anyway i don't think he does anything in that part that's like meaningful i think he's just I remember there being a part where Annabeth is like, oh, stop holding my hand. And I was like, oh, that's from the book. Mm-hmm. And But it was like, she was honestly sounded like disgusted by him. The other thing directly from the book was when Luke on the on his stupid yacht was yelling at Annabeth about like, don't you talk to me about Thalia when you're traveling with this guy while she's like holding a fucking pine stick. <laughs> she's in the middle of the ocean. And she's still holding that stupid fucking stick. <laughs> he just carries it. It's her <laughs> token of Talia. <laughs> if I ever do anything like that, you're allowed to like yell at me. And just be like, hold the fucking stick, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is going on? And the only thing you can hold on to is a literal stick from her tree that you can't just remember her inside your head. <laughs> It'd be oh, like if I God. walked around with like my grandmother's cookie in my pocket all the time like if i said if i didn't have that i would just like forget that she was my grandma even though she died when i was 16 which was like a million years ago um 23 years ago at this point still like i don't need that in order to remember that she existed and that i'm sad that she's dead (laughs) but then like everything that we just said is like completely ridiculous but it also feels like it doesn't even matter also because of the absolute batshit insanity that happens from this point forward. <laughs> yes. Okay, so Polyphemus' island. First of all, they combined Cersei and Polyphemus, but didn't have Cersei. Like, they speak in Cersei's island, and Polyphemus lives there. But, like, why is it an amusement park? <laughs> why? Why? I, like, before we watched this movie, I was searching for another clip of something or other for one of our youtube videos and this the like picture of it was like percy versus chronos and i was like what (laughs) like that never actually happens and the picture looked like the devil and i was like this never happened they don't they don't ever actually fight (laughs) like not really like what is what's going what what already i'm so confused and then in the background i saw like a roller coaster and I remember all of like the Percy Jackson friends besides you that I talked to, I all sent it to them and I was like, why the fuck is there a roller coaster? Why are they at Six Flags? Yeah. And they were all just like, you don't even know what you're asking right now because you haven't actually seen how crazy that part of the movie is yet. And now I understand what they meant because I genuinely, but I still just keep going back to why did they make Cersei's Island a ro- like a, a theme park? Why would yeah. Cersei make a theme park? Like, a spa still would make sense. It's just, I don't, I don't know. Did they think it's like it's the whole logic it? of, like, oh, Cersei knew that, that Polythemus was on this island, and she couldn't figure out how to kill him, so she just, she just made a theme park instead, and after the first day there, and everyone died, because they, there's a cyclops on this island that wants to kill people, she, they just, they kept the theme park up, though. Yeah. <laughs> And Polyphemus is in some sort of weird drought and, or famine where he has had to eat his own flock, which, like, where did that come from, too? I don't know. And, like, and he just, it's so, it's all so weird that I'm just like, I don't understand. I just don't understand why they would be like, oh, yeah, let's make Cersei's Island a fun theme park. I just, like, more than anything i wish i could find the author or the not the author the screenwriter for this movie and be like can you please tell me your thought process of how you read sea of monsters and then ended up making up a fake theme park i just i want to know 
how you got there? Like, did you think that there would be like merchandise or something one day? <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, let's make a. How how did you end up with Cersei creating a theme park for people <laughs> in the first place? It doesn't even make sense for like mythology, Cersei. No, like yeah. why the hell would she want to deal with any of that shit? Like, and like if Cersei made a theme park, wouldn't it be like a mirage or something because of her magic? Yeah, like, it'd be more like a sideshow. Like it'd yeah. be maybe more circusy. Yeah, and I was just like, you knew that Cersei had a spa. Why didn't you just make a spa? on yeah. the island and just have him be hiding out on the island somewhere like i genuinely will never get over that that all of this happens at a theme park well can't be just because it was like oh well where can we film this well this one did let us rent out for a day it's like oh we want children to watch our movie what do kids like kids like roller coasters oh my gosh. <laughs> So let's put roller coasters in the background of our movie and have the main actors go on one for like 35 seconds. But that's okay, what that really scene. Good. What got me angry in this scene, and I, I hate being this pedantic about character stuff, you know? But mm -hmm. at the same time, I feel like, again, th because they this this these adaptations are supposed to be so comedic, you can get a lot of comedy out of the fact that Annabeth has been at camp since she was seven and she doesn't know anything, right? She doesn't have any real world references. She knows Greek mythology and architecture and that's about it. So they have her singing It's a Small World on the Wait, rock. Why does she know about that? Yeah, I mean, it's that catchy of a song that like you, you hearing it once, yeah, maybe that would be enough. But, like, we have no sense that she's been to Disney World or Disneyland at this point. So, like, how would she know that? Oh, someone in my thing brought up a good point of why why is the park all run down if the fleece is on the island? And it's yeah. like, yeah, why does it look all decrepit and weird like that? Because the fleece is supposed to fix everything and make everything great. Why yeah, is it it's like, like they simultaneously took that away by making it like, oh, Polyphemus just uses this to lure satyrs for the smell. But the, the reason they were lured by the smell was because it was like bountiful, because it was, you know, like flowers and a meadow and and all of the beautifulness of nature. And then like weirdly brought that back again and acted like they didn't ignore it all that time because of the stupid, the, one of the stupidest fucking scenes of this whole movie with Annabeth that we'll talk about later. But yeah. The, the one thing I could say, but where did Grover get the eye on his head? I know, like, did he find <laughs> paper somewhere and just draw it himself? Um, <laughs> I was just a, such like a small nitpicky thing, but nothing in this movie makes any sense at all. I don't know why we're in a theme park. I don't know why Polythemus is in a theme park. I don't know why he even had all of these sheep in a theme park. I don't know why any of these things are happening or why he can't figure out how to leave this like room that he's in if he has the golden fleece and so like yeah i'm gonna question why grover is wearing a full-blown wedding dress and has like an eye on his head that looks like something he had to like make himself when he just like ended and like why is he in here like where did luke drop him off well, <laughs> did he so go this is first when he got to the island i'm thinking this through because polyphemus says to him i haven't eaten since those half-bloods you arrived with so that would have to mean some of Luke's henchmen took him there. Um, so yeah, he somehow ended up finding paper and a dress to pretend he was a handmaid. I mean, the, the way that Grover ended up in a dress in the books, for a reminder for anybody watching, is that as he was getting chased by Polyphemus, not on the island, or what, was it on the island? I don't even know. But he was getting chased by Polyphemus, and he ran into a wedding dress shop. And so he just went with it and was like, yeah, I'm a Cyclops and I'm wearing my Seder perfume. Let's get married. Yeah. Um, yeah. So where did he get the dress from? Where did he get the eye from? Where did he get the veil from? Um, you know, like how, how? <laughs> it's just all so dumb. <laughs> just... And Polyphemus's look, I don't, I don't know if I'm just like, you know, remembering Predator is wrong, but he looks like a Predator from the movie Predator. Like, 
the dreads, the, the weird tattoos. Like, what was that? I don't know. He looks like a weird mix of like an orc from Lord of the Rings with like something else. Yeah. They were copying what Lord of the Rings orcs look like. Um, yeah. With like the design, because so many things copy like orc, like Lord of the Rings orc design because of how popular those movies are. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what it reminded me of. It reminded me of that in like the World of Warcraft movies that I never actually watched. Um, but just seeing like pictures or trailers of them, that's what that reminded me of. And I'm like, this is supposed to be a Cyclops, so I'm not really sure if there's a... Why are all the Cyclops have dreads? <laughs> like, I, I don't know why that's like a weird thing that they're all doing. Yeah, they all just like grow their hair out that way. I, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, so we have Polyphemus. Um, we have the whole scene where in this one, they're trying to get the fleece from his shoulder and they're all getting thrown about. It's not really working that well. And this is, we'll get back to what happens to Annabeth because I know you hinted at it earlier too, but they do have Annabeth getting thrown, but she's fine. You know, like they could have put a scene of her getting injured in here where it belongs because it actually happens, but no, she just walks that off. Um, yeah, and Clarice gets like spit in her face. Like that was all okay. You know, like the, the final battle with Polyphemus, but where it gets stupid is you're gonna trap him with the rock that he used to trap Odysseus. He's the only person that can move it. <laughs> he, he can pick it up. He can He's just move up. it. <laughs> he's a cyclops that's what they could do right we can't do that they can and yeah. so did you use super glue <laughs> otherwise i don't know what's going on and also isn't isn't this where tyson like like temporarily dies yeah, so after that right after they lock polyphemus in somehow who won't, won't pretend he's actually locked <laughs> in like he can't just move it um <laughs> Then Luke appears and he's like, ha ha, you have the fleece and now I'm going to get it from you. I just remember something that we didn't cover that I just have to mention from the beginning yeah. of the movie when the bull is like attacking Percy and but it's I think he kills it. The way that they have Luke show up like you hear his voice before he comes on. That is the most over dramatic <laughs> entrance from anything that I've ever watched in the history of my life. And I was just like why are you at camp <laughs> like why are you here and it was just so funny how i was like i thought that, that that was like the voice of Kronos or something but i was like oh that's just luke talking like a fucking weird <laughs> and such a fucking weirdo this the bull and being like why don't you join me and it's like i don't want to murder people like but they don't even bring that part of it up they're just like oh your dad doesn't like you your dad doesn't pay attention to you why don't you just join the way that like percy in this movie would have joined luke if he just talked some more about how his dad won't talk to him because he's not good at, <laughs> because he's not good at class <laughs> he yeah. would give him like 10 more minutes and that probably would have actually worked on this version of percy because he's that stupid and has like he's no a little more <laughs> no morality at all and like so to like go back to this stuff with with um with Tyson just like the way that Ty like the way that Tyson dies I was so mad because I was like why are you sacrificing yourself for these people who don't give a fuck about you mm -hmm. like, the entire movie he's just like oh you're my brother I want to help my brother you're my brother of course I'm gonna help you and I'm like why there's he has done nothing to be worthy of this I felt like I was talking to my younger self <laughs> and I was just so bothered watching that happen and being like no don't kill yourself for him he's an asshole he like doesn't deserve it he's never helped you he's never done anything for you besides tell you that you're really ugly all the time and treat you like you're less than That's worth anything like, like he's like your bully he's not he doesn't deserve you sacrificing your life even if it doesn't actually happen that way just doing it at all it's just like he doesn't deserve this and and of course after he does it then percy is like oh i'm really sad because i never told him i loved him or whatever and i'm like you never told him anything nice at all yeah like anything nice at all you literally just told him he was ugly and that you didn't want to be around him 
and then yeah. used him on this quest and then never actually used him when you were fighting the Cyclops, <laughs> like you brought him along so that he would help you fight the Cyclops and then didn't use him at all when you actually were fighting Polyphemus. So I'm not sure what the point of all of that was, but you didn't do anything nice to him. Like Percy in like the books is being way too hard on himself, of course. And is like, I can't believe that he's gone. I can't believe that I was thinking negative thoughts about him for three seconds of my life when yes. I was in camp because everyone was bullying me and I was really like triggered and upset by that and is like thinking that he doesn't deserve to live because he was just overwhelmed by everybody bullying him for 10 minutes. And like this version of Percy should have actually like jumped off of the cliff like after Tyson was done and just get it over with because I was like, yeah, you actually should do that because of how bad you actually treated him this entire movie. Like real Percy doesn't do anything to bad to Tyson. He's his biggest supporter and literally gets in a fight with like anyone who matters with him basically in that in that book to defend him constantly and is willing to like blow himself up to try to save him because he feels so responsible for for Tyson being on this quest with him like that version of Percy would I don't even know what that like actual Percy would do to this version of Percy that treated him that badly and then just watched him like look like he killed himself didn't even try to stop it just like watched it happen and was just like oh now i'm sad and it's like oh really yeah like you think yeah like, that maybe... line of like i never called him brother and it's like yeah didn't call him anything at all besides ugly so like <laughs> i don't know why you're even bringing that up <laughs> like this of course you didn't call him a brother because you from the start didn't want anything to do with him mm -hmm. and wouldn't have had anything to do with him if he didn't like have to manipulate you into being around him at all you yeah. would have left him at camp and moved on with your life as if nothing ever happened because you're a horrible person like i generally don't know like i know i said this after the first movie but legitimately i don't know who logan lerman is playing but he has never played percy like that is not Percy and whoever, you know, the girl, Alexandra Daddario. That's not Annabeth either. And so I don't, that's not Grover either. I'm like, I don't know who these people are, but that it's like almost like a farce to like compare what the TV show is doing with like those actors with these actors. It's like, they're not even in the same general universe of the, you think you can't compare those two and how they play their roles because they're completely different people and that sounds weird because they're supposed to be the same people yeah but they're not. <laughs> well and that's why i said when we watched the first one it's a lot easier to take these movies as like something separate when you think of them as a parody of percy jackson like because that's really the only thing you can do here it's not exactly percy jackson it's not exactly the mythology and so like yeah it's just it's it's a humorous adaptation if anything i've heard people say even the musical is is more true to the books and i haven't seen really, it before yet people really like the musical um i know that it's on youtube i just haven't listened to it yet and that the musical actually is done really well one of the um writers some one of the main writers for season one um i forget his name right now but he wrote like episode six and episode four, I think. Um, he was one of the, he was the main writer of the musical. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't, he's not involved in season two anymore because he ended up getting a different job in the meantime when they were waiting for them to, you know, start things again. Um, but yeah, the musical is supposed to be actually really good and like on point when it comes to characterization. Like I've seen enough of it to know that that's true. And so it's ridiculous. Like, it's, I genuinely don't understand now all of the like random posts on like Reddit or whatever that I see of people trying to defend the movies now. Cause I'm like, there is literally nothing. And we haven't even gotten to the most iconic part yet. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there is like nothing in these to defend. I don't know, besides just being like, I watched these movies when I was a kid. And I enjoyed them. Other than that, I don't I don't know what you could possibly be def defending. 
or think that it, that movie could ever possibly be better than anything else in existence. The subreddit is probably full of younger people because we know at least our generation and, you know, like maybe even some of the Gen Zers that were fans, they probably were a little bit less with the, um, with the movies. They were probably more wanting a true to book adaptation. But yeah, I wonder if these are like Gen Alpha kids that are that are so happy about the movies because like they would have been, you know, actually little kids when they came out. So yeah, it would have been cool seeing Logan Lerman with water powers. Yeah. yeah. I, that's the only thing I can think of is that and that they somehow have never changed their opinion on it, even when they've gone back and watched it again. Yeah. Um, that's just being stubborn. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, there's there's one thing that I'm being stubborn about, so I will have some accountability here. The 100, I loved the TV series. It was awesome. I, I, I felt like it filled a hole that hasn't filled anything like since Star Trek The Next Generation for me. Um, so I loved that about it, but then I wanted more of it after I watched all of it. And it's based off of a book series, right? But the story with the 100 book series is that they pitched the book idea to Cass Morgan and she was in the process of writing it. She had an outline and then somebody picked it up for a show. So that's why there's similar characters. There's like a very similar starting premise, but they are not similar at all. It's very clearly like a YA, little bit more upbeat in the books and it's a very dark like um post-apocalyptic in the show mm -hmm. and it's still post-apocalyptic in the books but for some reason it's just the tone isn't as dark um and i will not go back and read like i have the first 100 book i don't know that i want to read it because i just love the show's version that much mm -hmm. um but like that's I feel like that's a weird case because it's not a one-to-one -one adaptation. Like it was never meant to be. It never could have been. They were being written at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and like, there are some not true adaptations that I do favor. Um, Troy is one of them. I kind of <laughs> like that. Um, was it An Interview with a Vampire? I feel like the books weren't as sexy as the movie was. And if you're a bisexual millennial, you loved the movie. Like it's just a thing. So, yeah, I can get that. And there are things like that too. But I also, I don't know. I can just acknowledge when I know that, like this isn't as good as I thought it was. I just still enjoy it. Yeah. And that's like the main thing is like you can still enjoy that and just like acknowledge the fact that they're not actually good movies at all. Like that's fine if you don't want to change your mind about something that you really liked when you were growing up. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, like, at this point, you're, like, bullying people on the show because of the, the movies, and it's like, do you even know what you're bullying people over? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not sure this is a really good life choice. <laughs> so let's, let's jump to the really outrageous part, because I don't even remember what happens between them defeating Polyphemus and them somehow getting to in front of the roller coaster. So... <laughs> In this like finale, we have Luke has the sarcophagus in the amusement park, and he has gotten his hands on the fleece. He's putting it over the sarcophagus. Um, Percy, Annabeth, and Ro Grover and Clarice are all tied up, um, but Percy happens to have his pen on him, so he's able to take it from pen form in his pocket to cut Grover out. That that is fine. You know that seems on brand. Um, but yeah, it goes off the rails a lot from there. So let's, let's see what you, you picked up first. <laughs> well, the first thing I thought of was just why does Kronos have a body? <laughs> the whole thing with Kronos is that he was chopped up into little tiny pieces and he doesn't have a body anymore. The whole storyline in the books is that Kronos's energy, not his body, his energy basically. Yeah. It's like being sucked into Luke where he eventually takes over like Luke's body 
And so it's like almost like you would imagine like a spirit like possessing someone or something. Mm -hmm. But Kronos himself never has a body. That's why when I saw like Percy versus Kronos, I was like, what the fuck? They never fight because he never, he can't, he doesn't have a, a form independent. Like Luke has to, Luke is like fighting as him. Like Luke is still in there, like doing things and stuff. And even if, even if Kronos is like sometimes talking for him or whatever, he has to let Kronos do that. And so like he never has his own body. And then I was like, why does he look like the devil? <laughs> and and it's just like so all so oh, I forgot to mention this, but when they're on the yacht and Luke sees Annabeth and he's like, Oh, nice to see you. Hope you're doing fine or something like that. I was just like, that's the only like thing you're going to say between the two of them to show that they know each other and so at the very when all of this is happening and annabeth says like one line of like of like no i thought you were better than this or something or she says something like that and i was just like oh my god just shut the fuck up <laughs> like, they haven't mentioned anything about how you and luke like actually really knew each other at all before so let's just like not even try to pretend like you Care because you clearly he doesn't care at all he talked to you like he would talk to like his neighbor <laughs> um but it was absolutely insane that they make like the form for um and it looks like a version of the devil mm -hmm. and he just is like like walking and i was just like what is what and he eats luke <laughs> Oh my gosh, wait. Okay, so I love what they did there only because of how he says it when he's like, I'm your great grandson. And he's like, oh, my favorite. <laughs> because, you know, he's told him that he says my favorite before eating him. Because I'm just thinking, canonically, this is a god who has eaten his children. And so him saying, like, this relative baby, <laughs> like, my like Hermes, I guess. Hermes tasted really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so um the thing that also kills me is that when percy does whatever the fuck he does to make chronos go away mm -hmm. that luke just like luke and when i was watching this movie for the i didn't i 100 percent did not notice that he also ate grover and it's just like funny until Grover like came out and I was like, when the fuck did that happen? <laughs> but it's also just so funny that he eats them, but then when he's gone, he, they just like fall out of him as if nothing ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just alive again. And I'm like, then why did he eat them? <laughs> if well, that's like, what happened to his off. kids too, though. His kids came out whole and fine. So maybe his stomach just can't digest children. <laughs> I guess he doesn't like satyrs or something. <laughs> I don't know. Well, no, but Luke doesn't get digested. So Luke gets spit out, but for, for um, he gets spit out right in front of Polyphemus. So that means Luke gets eaten twice. Uh huh. <laughs> like that's a really rough way to go, man. And it's just like Luke is like so just annoying. Like he's not a good villain. He's wearing like all black. Like he is in his emo phase or something. He has no personality. No personality. There's one line where Annabeth is like, are you really going to kill the entire world to, just to make your dad mad? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, it's usually, like, that's definitely what he's doing. But usually <laughs> conversations like that don't happen that way. Yeah. And it's just, I don't, it, it's just insane that, like, he fights Kronos at all. Mm -hmm. And then because for some reason, the fact that his sword that is not supposed to be from his dad, but in this movie is a Poseidon sword, that somehow it being a sword of Poseidon kills him. And I'm like, why? Hmm. It's like, they don't really explain. They like use, <laughs> I like how they like use the prophecy. And they're like, oh, a sword is supposed to reap my soul. So I guess this sword is just gonna kill Kronos and his soul, and so I'm just going to use it. And I was just like, this is so dumb <laughs> with how they're, like, doing this this way. That, like, the idea that, like, three hours ago, 
Percy, like, gets told the prophecy in, like, the most runabout stupid way ever. And then, like, three hours later, he's like, oh, the prophecy came true. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, like, did everything that I was supposed to do. And I didn't have to wait even one day, really, to find out what would happen. It's just, it's done now, I guess. So I guess I can just, like, move on with my life because every villain I'm supposed to fight for the next four years is dead already. So what the hell am I supposed to do now? <laughs> and it's just absolutely, ins I, like, so want to know how they came up with any of this. Like, why are you at a theme park? <laughs> why why is Kronos the devil? Why was he so easy to kill? Um mm -hmm. like the whole great thing in the books is that that like Luke kills himself because it's like the not even the bare minimum, it's less than the bare minimum of what Luke can do. But he at least does that where like Percy doesn't have to be the one to kill him. This is like the only nice thing that Luke has done in like five or six years at this point. And so he at least takes himself out so that Percy doesn't have to also kill him because that would be really horrible if he would have had to do that. And so at least he does that and takes himself out so no one else has to be the one to have killed Luke. Um, but like the whole thing is that like Luke kills Kronos because Kronos is inside of his body. Mm -hmm. And that's like why he dies. Like it's not like this over dramatic, weird like villain fight that is like it's like a weird mix of like the devil and also like the version of sauron that you see in lord of the rings when when he like is fought, trying to find them when when frodo puts on the ring and stuff and i'm like this is so i was like just watching it like <laughs> i don't know what i'm even watching like my mind is just like blank because i don't even know what to think about this because it's just so crazy that Luke gets eaten by Kronos, and then he gets eaten by Polyphemus, and I'm just like, is he just supposed to be dead now? <laughs> He's dead for sure. You don't survive getting eaten by a Cyclops, so. And so, like, Chris Rodriguez is at the stupid, like, theme park, because yeah, I remember yeah. him being like, oh no, Luke! And I was just like, why are you here if he's gonna be eaten in five minutes? And his whole thing is gonna be over, like, why are any of you here? Why do any of you care? If it's so easy to kill him that this is just he accidentally falls into Polythemus's cave that he can yeah. easily get out of because he can move because he can move the rock himself. <laughs> he's just staying in there because he's having a bad day or something and ends up in there. And so it's just <laughs> it's just all so stupid. Like why didn't Luke just like try to climb out of the hole he fell out of instead of just, I guess, being eaten to death instead? There's just so many unanswered questions and none of them make any sense. And it was just like the idea that you could hear about the prophecy and then literally like three hours later, the prophecy is just over. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it was like the worst story construction of anything, like at all, ever, like of any sort of movie, like that there's no buildup to anything. And it's just, it absolutely makes no sense knowing that like they wanted to make more movies. And it's like, then why did you do all of this stuff in this movie if you wanted to make more? Yeah. I'm so confused by that. <laughs> yeah, Kronos is the big bad of the entire series. So there's no point having him be defeated like that unless you're going to, like, Voldemort, he gets a second body, which, like, he's not even supposed to have that body in the first place. And then with Luke, are we going to do the cartoonish villain thing of we see them almost die but since we didn't actually see them die on screen he's not actually dead so third movie he would have came back like what were we expecting here i like like think like jesus every single day that this these movies stop before they went to titan's curse yeah because i would have like killed myself <laughs> oh my gosh what would they have done with annabeth like think about it because this annabeth they made annoyingly feminine and i don't know if that's like correct to say but what i mean by that is like she's wistful and like romantic and that's not annabeth you know and she's also just like a like a damsel in distress yes and stuff like she doesn't have like anything like you don't know why people like her i guess is what i'm saying like she doesn't show she doesn't she's, seem like bull in this one like, she doesn't seem intelligent or different of any kind. She doesn't really add anything with anyone. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I don't know why any of these people like her so much. 
and and it's just like and she she doesn't like add anything any anything else it doesn't seem like she knows exactly how to fight well like actual annabeth is like the best at fighting than anyone because she doesn't have any other powers and so she's really good at like actual fighting because she doesn't have any other powers to use any of them for but like this version of her needs to be like bailed out by everybody else and also the weirdest one of the weirdest scenes in this whole stupid movie and so i like it's honestly terrifying to imagine how badly they would fuck up like titan's curse because that movie or movie that because that book is so good like i literally look at it every single day in my apartment and just stare at it because of how much i love it i just look at it like i love you so much and i can't wait to like read you again and remember how much i love it but i'm just it's like terrifying to imagine like what they would do with all of the really good storylines that are in that book that are very like complicated and serious and complex like who they would turn Salia into oh my fucking god she would probably be walking around talking about like Ger gerard way or something if mm -hmm. they if they like let her be more of a character besides her showing up with her leather jacket at the very end of the movie um but like yeah it's honestly terrifying what they would would do especially because this percy would he wouldn't he wouldn't do any of the things that percy does in that book like if Annabeth was kidnapped, he would be like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I lost my homework again. <laughs> like, I'm going to go tell Tyson he's ugly a couple more times and then just sit in my ca in my cabin and be emo about it, I guess. Because he's yeah. completely helpless and a fucking idiot. Clarice would probably be the one that would want to go off and save Annabeth. And then he would want to come to, like, you know, prove that he's a big, strong man. But he wouldn't actually want to go off on his own. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, so, okay, before we get off of the depiction of Kronos really quick, mm -hmm. I had to rewatch This Is The End. I don't know if you ever watched that one. It was a Seth Rogen, like him and all of his friends play themselves and it's supposed to be basically like those stoner guys if the rapture actually happened. And so they're at a Hollywood party. Like when the rapture happens, nobody gets sucked up. So nobody believes them when the two people that went to the store are like, hey, so the rapture is happening. <laughs> and then like the earth starts splitting. And it's basically like a survival movie until the very end when they, like they, it's basically like demons are taking over the world. And um, the very end scene is Seth Rogen. Well, not the very, very end, but the, the finale is Seth Rogen and I forget what his friends, Jay, his friend Jay, who's like the main character of the movie. Um, they are left on earth still. They are being chased by this huge ass devil and it looks like a Kronos. It like has the lava effect, but they gave him a huge penis that like is visible. Um, that's like the only difference really. And the snakes that like pop out later but it looks so similar that I had to go back and it's not as similar as my brain was thinking, but it's still similar enough that I'm like, yeah, they totally went with devil imagery here. Yeah, I kind of wish, now that I'm like sitting here thinking about how ridiculous this scene is, I kind of wish they would have gone on the roller coaster and somehow would have killed him on the roller coaster. Oh <laughs> because at least then there would have been a reason they why. Him as they're going by or something. Or why they're at a theme park. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So the final move that gets him is basically, have you seen people do this move on like Tears of the Kingdom um, gameplays where they'll take a sword that has the frost, like some sort of frost and then like as they're going down, it's just turning frosty and little frost platforms will come at you. That's what that reminded me of, how he just ends up going down Kronos. Um, and that lost platforms will come at you. That's what that reminded me of, how he just ends up going down Kronos. Um, and that is what kills him, disintegrates him, whatever it may be. Um, but we don't end there. There's somehow a stray manticore still around that happens to sneak up on Annabeth and sting her. She legitimately dies. Her final words being, at least I get to be in Elysium with Talia. And like, then they put the fleece on her and she comes back to life. 
<laughs> so in this like universe, Annabeth is canonically um, a zombie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also just like that scene. Okay, uh, you have to have watched the Mummy movies. Um, so you know the second Mummy movie, The Mummy Returns where they have that scene where one of the bad guys walks up and kills um, Evelyn, like just stabs her and just surprises them by doing it out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And then like, of course, Rick freaks out, but then he brings her back and I'll, whatever. I love those movies. Anyway, this scene reminded me of that movie, of how that scene happened, about the way that the thing was just there randomly and wasn't there before and then suddenly just appears because sure why is there a manicure in this movie at all well, it was <laughs> like, on luke's ship yeah so. and it's just like why is he there isn't a manicure in this stupid book that this is yeah. based off of why is it here besides the fact that you wanted to make one i guess i don't know but and it's just like all of a sudden there and like is like bing bye and like the way that she like falls over and is just like trying to say words and Percy is like, no, don't. I was like, you watched The Mummy Returns. <laughs> you, somebody, somebody watched that movie and loved it as much as we all do. Plagiarism. Like reenacted that scene in this movie because I'm like, this is so obvious. Like, it's so similar. <laughs> and I know that it's like a stereotype kind of scene, but it just reminds me so much of that that I'm like, it has to be you. someone who made this movie liked that movie because it, it feels like this movie was trying to be an action movie, so that wouldn't be shocking if that is true. Um, but it's just, once again, like, so dumb. Like, I don't know, like, they never actually established why Percy would love Annabeth, even as, like, a friend. Other than she's hot. <laughs> like, I don't, yeah, like, I don't know, I don't know why you care so much about her. Like, like, if even on like the TV show, like in the first few episodes, you would understand why Annabeth being like mortally injured like that would make Percy really upset and make him panic and stuff because they do a good job of setting up their friendship and why they would care about each other. But in these movies, they never really do that. They don't really like each other the whole first movie basically. And then in this movie, she's like a friend, but she's not, really a friend like not really like she is but they don't really have any moments that makes it clear that they like you know love each other or whatever and so i don't know why they care like why he's so upset i guess besides that she's someone he likes but i'm like i don't know why you like her i don't get like what he is supposed to be so upset about and so and i also don't understand why she died in such a stupid way yeah, that's not very Annabeth like. And how did no one notice this stray manticore? Yeah. Um, which, yeah, like I'm assuming it came. It's the same one from the ship. But why did? Why would? How was Luke commanding this manticore to just like go about? That doesn't really make sense either. Like he did have monsters on his side, but they were more sentient monsters. And I, I also just don't get why they like. What is the word I'm thinking of? Like why they made her such a damsel in distress like mm-hmm. she doesn't fight doesn't get a chance to fight she doesn't get a chance to defend herself she's just like a helpless girl mm-hmm. who needs to be saved by like everyone else and it's just that's so not annabeth like she's not that sort of person like even the biggest stuff that happens in the books like them falling into tartarus and stuff she's telling him not to go with her yeah and- and everything like she's like no like you stay like st- don't come down here with me and he's like fuck that like i'm not leaving you to go through that by yourself but like she's doing all this she does so much stuff on her own she doesn't need like the whole thing of why percy and annabeth are great is that they you, they're like a really great team in the way that they like work together really well and you and like it's not like one or the other does everything. Like they work, they both have strengths that work well together where all of their plans work out. Where if they were doing them alone, they probably w- wouldn't work out the same way. But it's not like one person is doing everything and the other person is doing nothing. And so to have her be like so helpless that Percy has to like save her entire life, like that she is just dead 
and we have an overdramatic scene of her being like, I'm going to say hi to Thalia so I don't have to, like, hold onto this stick anymore. <laughs> and is just, like, so weird. And, and it's just so not... It's so strange because it this obviously never happens in any of the books. Like, it, it's, it's not even similar enough to a scene like that that happens in the last book. And it's, it happens a completely different way in that book, so it can't possibly be based on that. Um, yeah. And so it's like, why would you make up a scene where Annabeth is the damsel in distress and dies and is brought back to life? Why, like, why was her being, like, seriously injured with, like, multiple broken ribs not enough for you? Like, she had to be, like, actually dead for it to matter? Yeah. It was just so strange. It, this whole thing is just so weird. But I'm like, I don't, I don't get why they added all of this stuff in, I guess. Like, I don't understand why they added in all yeah, of this, it, this entire segment that doesn't, that isn't in the books and doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so, you know, I said it in the Polyphema scene, but they had her get thrown by him, which is part of what happens where she actually needs the fleece in the books. So they, it was so unnecessary that they did it that way, plus because she was actually like literally dead, it takes away the magic of what happens later with the tree because um, like, we know that it can heal her in the books because she is, she does have multiple broken ribs and can barely move and then can suddenly like at least escape with them. Um, mm -hmm. But then when it, it's laid on the tree for long enough that Talia actually comes out like, that is just, you know, nobody could have guessed it. Now it's kind of like, okay, we maybe we should have guessed it. <laughs> like, you know. The, the book version of that was, like, one part we didn't talk about when we did our episode of the book that I thought was funny was, or I liked, was, like, almost like the weird banter that Percy is having with Thalia when she first wakes up before he fully realizes who she is. Because mm -hmm. nobody else is talking to her, and he's like, what is wrong with all of you? Yeah, it's just the way that she's like, she's like, I was dying. And he's like, No, you're not dying. <laughs> and She's like, but and he's like, you're at half you're in like, you're at camp half blood, you're safe now. And she's like, but I thought and he's like, No. And just like the back and forth, like, banter before she finally says who she is, mm -hmm. is like funny to imagine that happening. But in this version, it's also doesn't feel as special because it already happened and the whole thing of her coming back is like nobody including Chiron even thought that it was possible mm -hmm. for that to happen like one thing I, did, I didn't mention either when we were talking about our last chapters was um the dream that book Percy has that will probably be in the show with Kronos where Kronos is saying that he's in the same place as Polyphemus, like, stuck on the island, thinking that he, like, you know, beat them when he really didn't. Because they basically just, like, let him believe that he killed them, even though they he obviously didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and he's saying, like, you're in the same place that he is. And he's, like, laugh, like, openly, like, laughing at him in this dream that obviously, per like, you know, is foreshadowing for for Thalia coming back them thinking like them feeling like they like stopped their plan when they actually didn't mm -hmm. but none of that is happening in this and so it's just it seems so silly that they do it like that because the whole thing was that you're supposed to be completely shocked that she's it's even possible for her right. to even be alive anymore like nobody thought that the they would heal the tree to the point that it would like just like shove her back out because they healed her inside of the tree like itself basically like yeah. nobody thought that that was possible except for probably chronos maybe like obviously but and so in this version of it i didn't even wait until like i didn't i stopped watching the movie before we actually get to the part about thalia because i'm so tired of this stupid movie that i was just like i know i already watched the scene with thalia on youtube and laughed about how she comes out wearing a leather jacket <laughs> and how funny that is and so i'm like i don't need to watch this again and i know that all of these stupid scenes are just building up to this and i'm tired of watching this movie ruin everything that i like about this entire property so i'm just going to turn it off before they even get that far it was like a scene when percy was talking to chiron um before it even happens and i was just like i can't do this anymore yeah <laughs> um, so it 
it doesn't make sense the way that they have someone go fetch Percy in the movies because in the books it's like I I forget how he gets alerted that he's there but the reason he's he's the only person acting like you said was that he's the only person not shocked like well, the way the way it happens in the books makes more sense because um Annabeth was the one out there like guarding yeah. the hill when when Thalia came back and so Grover like runs into Percy's cabin and is like getting trying to get him but he is like in such shock about what has happened that he's not actually saying words he's just saying like come he's trying to tell percy to come with him he's saying annabeth and so percy comes with him because he's worried that like something happened to annabeth or something and then he gets there and he sees that annabeth is fine and he's like oh and then he sees that she's standing over somebody and she's like oh what but like grover is so shocked by the fact that thalia is back that he literally like cannot speak and cannot say words about what is going on, but just like one, but just like ran to get Percy because he like, of course he would run to go get like his best friend who's Percy, especially when like all of a sudden there's another like big three kid that just like is suddenly alive. Like, and, but that's how it happens in like the book where they run and get him, but they're so shocked that none of them can even tell him what's going on <laughs> because he's the only one who knows how to, who, who's like, able to speak still but in like this version of it it's all just so dumb like especially how they had his whole stupid storyline about like nobody at camp likes me and my dad doesn't like me because i can't win games and i don't get to go on big adventures <laughs> and so it's like why would they go and get him then yeah because yeah. Like, because nobody at camp likes you and they would go and run and get clarice and this like very strange universe over Percy. And so, of course. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Like the way that they're standing there does not give the impression that they're shocked into silence. It gives the impression that they're waiting. And so it almost, it, it gives the feeling that Percy was alerted to this and that's why everybody's suddenly like rallying and being like, oh shit, that's Talia. Uh, but yeah, the books, it, it I think that'll be a very powerful scene. I can see Walker really, really getting to work on that one. Um, you know, like really being like, what the hell is wrong with you guys? Um, hi, are you okay, girl? Yeah, that's gonna be like a really great scene on the show because Walker is Walker and he'll do a great job with yeah. that. And especially because the way that it happens in the books is like when he is, I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but have you ever had like, dreams or something about like little parts of your life that don't really seem to matter like just like a dream i'll have like dreams sometimes of like 20 seconds of my life and i'll be like i don't know what the hell why i'm dreaming about this and then like a couple years later like that tiny little section of like my life will actually happen and i'll be and i'll get like super huge deja vu and i'll be like that's weird but that's interesting and but it's almost like that feeling where you're like saying something out loud and you're realizing as you're saying it that you already know the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what Percy is doing in that scene is he he's asked as he's asking her, like, who are you? He realizes who she is. And since they have like that, you know, the dream with her in it earlier in the book that I'm sure will be in the show that it makes sense that all of a sudden it like clicks with how everybody is acting and the way that and that she is the girl from his dream and that must be like Thalia because who else would that girl random girl in my dream be who knows that people call me seaweed brain and stuff <laughs> but it's like a whole thing of him realizing as he's saying it like oh fuck like this is this is Thalia isn't it because she's next to the tree and she sounds really confused <laughs> and she's really trying to say that she was dying and like you won't believe me that she's not dying um but it's a whole like big like moment because that of course like changes everything again like at the end of sea of monsters they think that everything is they have things somewhat figured out he's like the prophecy is about me i'll probably i'll like deal with this i'll, I'll do whatever this is i'll figure out a way to handle whatever i'm gonna have to do one day in the future um 
and he knows about it enough and feels like he can handle it, they were able to save camp. And so that was like the main thing. And then all of a sudden she's there and it's like, oh fuck, <laughs> like now she's back. I don't know what the prophecy is about Percy anymore or about me and everything is about to get turned upside down like again. And, uh-huh. and also like realizing, you know, like his dream that Kronos did somehow beat them, even if it seemed like they won. Um, that he can always somehow outsmart them in that manipulative, annoying way that abusive people like that do. Because they just, you just don't think of the things that they would do. And so nobody would think that he would bring, like, a teenage girl back to life just to use her so he could, like, take over her body and then kill her when he's done with her. Like, no one else would even see Thalia as an option for that. And so there's so much, like, emotional stuff. And it also just, like, leaves you at the end of that season just being like oh my god like what is about to happen in the next season now that she's back like especially because that whole season talks about how like how i don't know if you and thalia would get along or not Mm -hmm. and so they never mention that of course in this movie because why the fuck would they do that and so there's none of that in the movie in the show and it will be there it's there and so so it's like a foreshadowing thing of i wonder how this is all going to go like or how badly this could go um, now that she's back, because we don't, we don't really know how what she's gonna feel about Luke and everything either. Yeah. But this movie is just like, well, Luke was eaten twice. Yeah. And she probably doesn't give a fuck about him if because Annabeth also doesn't give a shit about him at all. Well, just we have the Chronos fight, so what prophet like the prophecy's done? Like, why does it even matter that she's even here? Nothing matters anymore. There's no villains to fight. Everyone is gone. The, the scariest villain that is like one of the worst villains in all of mythology was killed by like one sword at a theme park. So like, why, <laughs> why, why are we even here anymore? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like it makes you wonder, I know I sent you someone's TikTok that was uh, making a joke of it of like, oh, we're not gonna get three more movies. So we might as well put the Kronos fight in here. Cause why not? <laughs> Um, like that, that's really what it feels like. It feels like somehow they knew that this was going to be the end, but they also didn't, they also did want more. And so it's just like, how are you going to make more when you, you change the plot so much at this point that like nothing matters. It reminds me a lot of, um, I call them like the Marvel bros of the world the like 18 19 year olds that like watching things for like costumes or fights but like don't seem to understand how like character development or like building things up until you get to a certain point works like a lot of those people when the obi-wan kenobi star wars like tv show was on disney plus a lot of them were annoyed that they didn't have obi-wan and like darth vader or anakin um, cause it was Hayden Christensen playing him. Um, they didn't have them fight until like the last episode or one of the last episodes. And I haven't actually watched that show yet. Just, I want to, but I just haven't. But a lot of them were like complaining in the earlier episodes that they weren't fighting yet or that they weren't like showing them fighting. They're like, why are you having these two people, these two characters be in the show if they're not gonna interact and i remember making a video to one of them being like because this is how storylines work this is how writing works like your literal job is to be like a critic where you critique movies and you don't understand that if you give people what they want the exact second there's no build up to it it feels way better when you build up to it happening and then when the fight actually happens there's all this like tension and years of like storylines being brought up to that point so it just is way more satisfying when it actually happens and you're way more like personally invested in everything that's going on on screen because it's like like when you get to like book five it's like this is the fifth book it's been five years if you waited every year between the books but at least five books you've been waiting to find out how everything is going to go between like luke even and percy how everything is going to end and you find when you finally get to that point it's so like satisfying to see all of that stuff pay off and i guess it's almost like they wanted to do that fight because it would be fun for them to do because it's a fun 
like fight but they didn't want to actually take the time to like work the storyline like you're supposed to to the point where it, it like actually pays off the way that it's supposed to and so instead they did it in this movie in the stupidest way possible and you don't care about any of it because it's he's not a scary villain you hardly even got to know any of the villains in either of these movies and so there's not like the emotional like you know being relieved or or whatever when they die because you barely even know who they are <laughs> yeah and they're just gone so easily it just is such i feel like they just like wanted to do it because they thought that it would be fun and didn't think past that and didn't think about how they just got rid of every villain in in all of the movies and so what like there's nothing like i generally don't know what they would have done with like titan's curse because everything in titan's curse is still about chronos and so like and luke is also you know not eaten twice and so i don't know what they would have even done in those movies it would have been completely these movies are already not like any in any way like accurate but it would have been even crazier because any storyline that they would have done couldn't have happened because everyone that would have been involved in it is already dead mm -hmm. and so i don't it just is like the laziest kind of i don't like the word lazy because Laziness isn't really a thing most of the time, but it's kind of one of those words people say to make you feel bad about not being willing to like work yourself to death. But yeah, uh, but in this instance, it does feel actually lazy of them as like a studio and a, and a writer and a director to just not want to like put in the effort to actually make a good story and just like do it in this way because they just feel like it and they don't care if they're completely ruining everybody's storyline because they obviously don't actually care about anybody at all yeah well they probably would have been just as lazy to try to fix it because they would have then just said oh he didn't actually die and chronos never actually dies either because i i don't know like spirit i who knows they would have found a way his soul is still alive um something like that they would have done something cheesy to get around it and it would have continued to feel like this parody of mythology and parody of the story. Even like what we, um, we never actually said anything about Tyson coming back to life necessarily, like the way that he just like is back. Like it's Percy's law. Like Percy is just sad for a couple minutes and then he's just magically back. And he's like, oh, I just like, I just like got myself out of that stream, I'm fine. And it's just like, then why did any of that happen? <laughs> But it's like that whole thing of there's no like emotional resonance to anything at all. Like in the in the books, Percy and Annabeth think that he's dead for a while and they're generally surprised when he's alive and they're very like scared about a lot of things in this time between because they think that he died. Mm -hmm. And so when he comes back, it is like this amazing that you're so relieved when he comes back because you've been reading them for many chapters being scared of somebody else dying because now they know that people can die. And yeah. so there's just none of that. It's just so, I don't know, it just reminds me of a lot of action-ish movies that are out there that are made regularly, especially during this time. Yeah. It's just like vapid. There's like no character development and there's hardly any story. They, it feels like they're just movies that were written so that cool fight scenes would happen. And like, if this movie wasn't Percy Jackson, that would be fine. But because those movies can sometimes just be fun to watch. Like I watched, there's so many movies like that I used to watch all the time when I was during those years that are just like kind of vapid, whatever action movies, but they're just like fun to watch. So I would just watch them a lot as when I just wanted something to watch. Um, but this is like, not that this is a different thing. It's not just like a silly action movie. Sorry, my phone's gonna die again. <laughs> but I don't know how you could watch like this or read the book enough to be like verbatim quoting it in certain parts and and then treat it like it's just another silly like rush hour movie or, or action movie like that or something. Yeah, it's it's somehow like they read it enough to know what happens, but not enough to really understand it because all of the emotions pulled out of it. All of the big stakes are taken out of it. And um, what we end up with 
is such a bad turn of the plot that like the only way to salvage it is to continue being super cartoony, you know? And Luke is already a cartoon villain in these movies because he is so flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really don't, I don't know. I don't even know what else to say about, about those besides, like I get why Rick Varden hated them so much and why he tweeted about them constantly and will never want anything associated with them because that was absolutely insane. Well, and I I do understand like money is power and people will do anything for money, but it sucks that like such a, um, that like something like that could actually happen just based off of money. Cause Rick probably signed a contract thinking he'd have a little bit more creative control, thinking that you know, the payoff would be worth it for him. And I'm sure he would gladly give that money back to like not have these movies exist the way that they do. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if, so one thing I've learned from authors and stuff being on TikTok is that a lot of times when somebody gets like a book deal, they'll also a movie, like movie rights will be like included as part of a multi-book deal. And so I wouldn't be surprised if when he got his book deal with Disney, Hyperion Books, when he was putting out these books, because these movies started coming out when he was still writing the books and they weren't even finished yet, I wouldn't be surprised if the, a movie rights deal was part of that. Um, but you never know if like anyone is actually going to, like movies like that are in development forever sometimes, even really popular ones that are never actually made. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, if like Fox took the idea and started making it. And he probably thought that if he said that he like didn't want them to do it, that they wouldn't because he didn't want them to do it. He said he didn't want them to do it, like explicitly told people that he didn't want it to be made into a movie and stuff, but they obviously just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like he just signed a deal for like his movie rights when he first made the deal to put out all of the Percy Jackson books, not expecting it to be popular and not expecting someone to actually want to make them into movies. And then when they did, they didn't care that the author didn't want them to make them and just made them anyway. And so I've heard things like that happening before with other authors, like when a, a movie or, or whatever of their thing comes out, them saying before it comes out, like, I didn't want this to be made and I had like nothing to do with any of this, just so you guys are aware that if this movie is really bad, I had, it wasn't because of me. I didn't even want this to be made, but they just did it anyway. And so I feel like that's probably what happened here because it's very obvious how he's felt about it from the very start. Yeah. Um, and they just wanted some like quick money and thought that it would be a way to make money because it's a popular book series with kids and stuff. And I still don't know if they would want kids to watch this movie because of how much they talk about sex. Um, but in theory, that's why they probably wanted to make it. Well, I, I will say that in our generation, sex and romance was shoved down our throats a little bit more even in kids media. Yeah. Um, so like that, this one, I can't, I can't judge with my 2024 20, eyes if it was too much for back then or not, um, especially because I was already an adult. Um, and I was, we both were on the older end of people reading Percy Jackson. Like we weren't necessarily the target demographic. We were a little bit older. Um, so even if they were targeting us, like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It, it still doesn't fit. So it, it is like they tried to make a coming of age, like college kind of tale. And it just, it didn't land the way that it was supposed to because it was originally a story about a 12 year old. Yeah. And like all of the like depth of it was just like taken out. Mm -hmm. And so once you take all of that out, there's like nothing special about it that makes it worth making it into anything at all yeah you have to make it flashy and have roller coasters and shit in the background i guess yes 
for do we want to dive into Titan's Curse or do we want to watch the musical since I brought it up? Hmm. We could watch the musical. That would be fun. Okay, yeah, let's try to find it. I'm sure it's probably easy to find on YouTube. So I have a friend that sent it to me. I'll just ask her to send me the link again. Like the whole thing is on YouTube, so yeah. it'll be very easy to watch it. Awesome. Okay, we'll do that. Next week we're talking about the musical. Okay. All right, bye.